Today's video is sponsored by Wondrium, the premier entertainment and educational video subscription service. Look, if you're a regular viewer of any of my channels, you'll definitely have heard of The Great Courses Plus before, and Wondrium is basically the hyper-evolved beast version of The Great Courses Plus. Great Courses basically decided to add even more incredible educational to their content and become Wondrium, yes. Whatever you've ever wondered about, you can find on Wondrium. See what they did there with the name? Clever. Look, they've carefully created long and short form videos from tutorials, documentaries and more. It's an amazing place to expand your mind and become a big brain. And look, if you like what I make on this channel, you're going to enjoy Wondering. They even have a bunch of sort of science, sci-fi related content. Great one is all about science and philosophy. It's called Sci-Fi, but P-H-I. Again, very clever with the names, Wondering. I mean, it looks at movies like Interstellar, whether time travel is possible, paradoxes through the lens of Doctor Who, or the Matrix to consider whether or not we actually have free will, which is terrifying. Look, this is up your street. It is something you will enjoy, and you can try it for free by going to wondrium.com forward slash sci-fi. Again, give it a try for free at wondrium.com slash sci-fi, or click the link below, and let's get into today's video. On February the 28th, 2020, English-American physicist Freeman Dyson died at the age of 96, cursing the fact that his name had been attached to the ludicrously impossible portrayal of a Dyson sphere that has permeated much of science fiction. And that is the end of the video, because we already answered the question, except it's not. It's not. Stay here. There's lots of fun ahead. He also died, by the way, arguing that global warming was a good thing. So he should probably be happy that he's just remembered for that Dyson Spear. Right, Freeman? Right? So how exactly was this colossal megastructure depicted that so upset Dyson? People generally think of a Dyson Sphere as a solid, hollow sphere that encapsulates an entire star, harvesting all of the energy that it produces. Indeed, this is how it is often seen in sci-fi shows like Star Trek The Next Generation, one of my favorite episodes, by the way. It's also a pretty stupid idea for a couple of reasons. The first is materials. A civilization would need to harvest multiple entire solar systems worth of material to get enough metal to build this kind of structure. That is dozens of entire planets that would have to be destroyed to build this ridiculous thing. Another minor issue with this version of the Dyson Sphere is that it would completely block out the sun and an act of cartoon level supervillainy. Is supervillainy a word? <laughs> it should be. So, sure we could work around that problem thanks to the seemingly infinite amount of power that would now be at humanity's disposal. We'd easily have the energy to power enough electric heaters to maintain the planet's temperature and to power enough grow lights to maintain all of Earth's vegetation, thus providing a hilariously impractical solution to a problem that didn't exist until we stupidly blocked out the entire f***ing sun. Alternatively, we could just ignore all of that nonsense and focus on the thing that Dyson was actually proposing in the first place. No, not the stuff about embracing the positive nature of global climate change. No, 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 the other thing he proposed. The badassly named Dyson Swarm. Or the Dyson Bubble, or the Dyson Ring. There's actually a bunch of different names and shapes for these things, but they all serve the same purpose. So we're just going to call it a Dyson Swarm, because... It's the best name. And unlike fully encasing a star, this is something that is actually kinda possible. The Kardashev Scale Look, for some reason, no discussion of a Dyson Sphere is complete without first talking about the Kardashev scale, and it's far from us to break that long-held internet tradition. The Kardashev scale was first proposed in 1964 by Soviet astrophysicist Nikolai, wait for it, Kardashev. It is a theoretical scale that categorizes how advanced a civilization is based on its total energy consumption. The assumption is that the more advanced a civilization becomes, the more energy it will need to power all of the cool sh** that they invented. It does make sense if all the alien civilizations are exactly like ours, or even remotely like ours, which, I mean, really? The Kardashev scale is broken into Type 1, Type 2, and Type 3 civilizations, and the amount of energy required increases as a logarithmic function. Type 1 is a civilization that has harnessed all of the energy of its home planet. Type 2 uses the whole energy of its home star, and Type 3 uses the entire energy of its home galaxy. Currently, humanity doesn't fit into any of these categories, so Carl Sagan expands 
expanded the scale to allow for intermediate values. This put us at about a 0.7, but harnessing the power of dice and swarm would bump us all the way up to a type 2 civilization. The reason that this is considered important is that any other space-faring civilization should need to make this same leap in order to leave their home planet, and as far as we know, dice and swarms are the most logical way to generate that kind of power. This means that if we want evidence there are other intelligent life forms traversing the universe, all we need to do is find evidence of a Dyson swarm around a star. A couple of years ago, we actually even thought we found one, but unfortunately, like every other exciting discovery from the far reaches of space, it was concluded not to be aliens. But assuming this is a requirement for civilizations to expand beyond their home planets, at least now we have an idea of what we're looking for. While the Kardashev scale does make some amount of sense as a metric, it is important to remember that it is just theoretical. It's a man-made scale that could arguably <laughs> and I'd say probably be considered rather arbitrary. We could just as easily categorize types of civilizations by their total population or the number of planets that they have colonized, metrics by which Elon Musk plans to single-handedly bring us up to type 2. The Dyson Swarm. All right, we get it. Enough stalling. Get to the facts that we know that a Dyson Sphere isn't the way to go. But what exactly is a Dyson Swarm? A Dyson Swarm would be a series of satellites orbiting the sun. These satellites would collect solar energy and then beam it back to Earth for us to use. Now, it sounds pretty simple in theory. <laughs> It does. It sounds enormously complicated. But it is definitely possible. If we wanted, we could theoretically start building one of these things right now. Of course, though, theory and reality often rather different things. The issue isn't whether or not a Dyson Swarm would work, because it absolutely would. The issue is how in the hell we're going to work out the logistics of such a massive venture. In case you forgot, the sun is really big. Its diameter is over a hundred times that of Earth. If we're going to encircle the sun with satellites, it's going to take a lot of material. Ideally, we'd want to make about a quadrillion satellites that were roughly one square kilometer each. Now, to that end, have you ever looked at a diagram of the solar system and thought, oh, f you, Mercury, you piece of sh**? F you. Well, good luck, because f Mercury is absolutely on the menu, because that's the planet we'd use to make a Dyson Swarm a reality. Mercury has a massive iron core, which is perfect for our goal. It's also the closest planet to the Sun, which is nice because it's going to cut down on travel time. Using Mercury to build our Dyson Swarm is by far the most realistic option available. And when we say using Mercury, we really do mean it, because we'd use all of it. About 70% of the planet is made up of an iron core. This can be combined with the oxygen in the atmosphere to create highly reflective hematite for our solar panels. Now, if you're wondering how we're going to get to Mercury to set up operations, don't worry. Few, if any, humans are expected to be involved in this process. Humans, we're frail. We're super weak. We like things like food and air and survival. Robots, on the other hand, they don't give a shit about any of that noise. They're made from metal. They don't breathe. And they can't even feel love. Ha! <laughs> Idiot robots. We just need to make robots that are designed to harvest Mercury's iron core and turn it into solar collectors. We also want these robots to be self-replicating because the more robots there are, the faster they'll finish the work. And look, already we've encountered just a few little logistical hurdles. While the idea of self-replicating nanobots is one of the most terrifying staples of science fiction, hello the replicators from Stargate, we haven't actually invented these things yet. Shipping armies of robots to Mercury would be expensive and it would take forever, so this technology is pretty important if we'd like our Dyson Swarm to start harvesting the sun's energy before it expands and swallows the Earth whole, which is a really long time in the future. But let's say we figure that shit out. Well, there's still going to be another issue. Mercury is mostly iron, which is fantastic, but about 30% of the planet isn't iron. If we want to get to that iron core, we need to figure out how to drill through the other 30% of the planet to get to said core. Now, to put that level of difficulty into perspective, there is roughly 550 kilometers of crust above Mercury's iron core. To date, the deepest humans have been able to drill on Earth is just over 12 kilometers. Seeing as you're all fans of science and all, you've already likely noticed that those two numbers, they're a little bit different. But you're also fans of science fiction, am I right? So let's continue hand-waving these problems away and say that humans have invented a drill that is capable of doing this task. And let's also assume that we've invented self-replicating machines that are able to harvest all of Mercury's iron because 
Why not? Now, running all of these machines is going to take a lot of energy. And I emphasized a lot there because it's a lot. But the good news is, there's a solution. We'll just use the Dyson Swarm to power the construction of itself. This is one of the easier hurdles in the construction. Once a satellite is completed, it can be launched to orbit the sun, where it will send its power back to the construction site. Doing this will be a necessity, as building a Dyson Swarm would otherwise require an amount of power that could only be provided by said swarm. Using this method, the machinery only needs enough power to get the first satellite into the air before becoming self-sufficient. At this point, many analyses like to imagine the project undergoing exponential growth. The first satellite launched will provide the power to build the next satellite. Those two provide the power to build the next two, the next four, and suddenly the entire project is completed in less than 10 years years. Now that's all well and good, assuming that the energy is the only limiting factor here. Even if the robots are self-replicating, there's still a limited number of them, as well as drills and everything else. Doubling the production speed with each launch of satellites would require doubling the amount of manufacturing equipment as well. Now we're not saying that this is necessarily impossible, but it sounds like an awful lot of resources that could have been used as satellites are being used for other means. And speaking of launching these satellites, how exactly are we going to do that? Well, fortunately, that's actually really easy. Spaceships are expensive, and they require rocket fuel. You knew that. Luckily, Mercury is close to the sun and has much weaker gravity than Earth. That gravity is only going to get weaker, too, as we repeatedly launch parts of the planet off into the sun's orbit. Instead of trying to fly the satellites into orbit, we could just fire them at the sun using a railgun. Sick. Now, that part should be fine. Experimental railguns have been built before, they just haven't been implemented by any military because they're impractical and not quite as cool as we'd like to imagine. Stupid video games misleading us. Now, assuming it could fire the satellites with enough velocity to escape Mercury's gravity and make it into orbit around the sun, there's really no problem here. So, now we have all of our solar power collecting satellites in orbit around the sun. Of course, this would require inventing some new type of solar panel, as the current ones we use on Earth are far too fragile and need to be replaced too frequently. These satellites would also need sensors and some ability to maneuver in order to avoid collisions with each other or anything else that happened to be floating around in space. Now, this is extremely important, as a single collision could be devastating. With the number of satellites that would be orbiting the sun, a single one breaking and creating shrapnel could create a massive chain reaction causing Kessler syndrome around the sun. This would not only destroy our Dyson Swarm and the power it provided, but it would prevent the creation of a new Dyson Swarm around the sun effectively forever. This would be really, really bad news, because that Dyson Swarm was f***ing expensive. Since we've now destroyed most of Mercury, leaving 30% of the planet as floating debris, this could be a very serious concern. But let's say all of this was handled. Swat away those problems. We wouldn't be harnessing 100% of the power generated by the sun since it wouldn't fully enclose it in a Dyson sphere. But even if we were only able to collect 1% of the energy from the sun, that would be more than enough. The amount of energy available to humanity would increase by roughly 500 trillion times, which would mean free energy energy for the entire planet, obviously. This brings us to our final problem, which is how exactly we are going to get that power back to Earth. Now, it's easy to say that we'll just use the power and beam it to Earth, but what does that mean? <laughs> You can't just beam energy. We've got stupid wires everywhere in our houses. Wireless transmission of energy is possible, though, but currently we have only two ways that are known to do it. The first is transmission via microwaves. The longest distance that energy has been sent using microwaves is about 150 kilometers. This would be fantastic if it wasn't for the fact that the 150 kilometer distance between the Earth and the Sun also includes the word million. <laughs> about 35% of the energy stream transmitted over that distance would also be lost, though if we could increase the distance by a factor of 1 million while well, still only losing 35% of the energy, that'd be pretty phenomenal. The other method we have for wireless transmission of energy is through lasers. This is even less effective, though, with a record distance of about 1 kilometer, which uh, is, is not very far. Wrap up. No, there's no reason that a Dyson Swarm would not be possible, and some argue that it would even be easy to build. In fact, it would be really easy to build one. All we need to do is invent self-replicating robots, design a new type of solar panel, figure out how to drill over 500 kilometers deeper into a planet than we've ever done before, destroy an entire planet, launch the solar panels into orbit around the sun, pray that none of them collide with each other or anything else, and then figure out a way to actually transmit all of that energy being collected a million times farther than we've ever done before. No big deal. Swap those problems away. But once all that other stuff is done, building a Dyson Swarm will be easy. <laughs>
easy, I tell you. Maybe that sounds a bit pessimistic, but it's a whole lot easier than, I don't know, something else equally impossible. Terraforming Mars. <laughs> Thanks for watching.